Dave Zirin, like what 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 are we to make of the the NFL's on the one hand um, really keen uh, and close following of trends in the black community because they got her H E R to to sing America the Beautiful. They knew where to find Jasmine Sullivan. They knew where to find Amanda Gorman. But at the same time, uh, insulting people with stories like this. It's tough because we know what this is. This is woke marketing writ large. Uh, yes. This is the incredible gap that exists between how power operates in the NFL and the bodies that they depend upon for the process of producing this product. This is a league, multi-billion dollar league built on black bodies and built on black minds and that those black bodies and minds are sacrificed for the purposes of this entertainment. It's that violent and brutal a sport. And yet, as Michael Bennett, former NFL player said, mm -hmm. the league is actually still segregated because it's segregated between those who have power and those who do not. Those who are executives and those who are in the owner's box and those who are or on the field. So it is still, in some respects, as Michael Bennett said, a segregated product. That's why the players say that NFL stands for not for long, you know, because you're just not there for long. Uh, Michael Bennett also said to me, they say behind the scenes that they say NFL stands for N word for lease, you know, so there's still <laughs> the players of who who they are relative mm -hmm. ownership. So what do we have here? How can you have a league that won't hire black executives, that won't hire black coaches, uh, and that, that will send the Chiefs out there on the field to the war chant being piped through the speakers, but at the same time, we'll bring out her and Amanda Gorman and Viola Davis and all the rest of it. I mean, to me, it's just the NFL almost daring us to call out how performative this product actually is. And it's the NFL trying to walk a tightrope between trying to sh say everybody, hey, we know we're not hiring black people for non-playing positions here. We know Colin Kaepernick isn't playing, but we, we are good people, we swear. And hey, younger generation that's tuning away to, to do TikTok and other things, we want your eyes, please trust us. You know, we, we are an ethical product. And I think that's the, the, the line that the NFL has been trying to walk now for, for several decades. Uh -huh. uh, is trying to show that they're one thing when actually they're another. It's 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 a it's a bit of an ugly process, but it's what the NFL clearly feels like it has to do. And in many respects, it's an indictment of uh -huh. their hiring practices that they even feel the need to do this in the first place. Yeah, what it feels like to me when I watch it, it feels like the NFL is like uh, purchasing racism offsets. You know, mm. well. Uh, yes, we were segregated by choice. Um, and yes, the first two black players, Kenny Washington and Woody Strode, who was Kenny Washington's roommate, Kenny Washington's teammate in college and in the NFL, who wound up playing uh, in the CFL. And yes, both of these guys hated playing in the NFL. Um, yes, we did this racist thing. Yes, we still do racist things. But it's okay. You know why? Because we gave Jasmine Sullivan a gig. We gave The Weeknd a gig. We got Amanda, uh, Amanda Gorman a gig. We gave um, her a gig. And so we're connected to Black people. Yeah, don't, we might be racist, but we're also giving Black people money, giving Black people a platform. So it all evens out. Right, Megan? It evens out, right? It's okay to do racist things if you give someone some money on the back end. Megan, doesn't it even out? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in their mind, it does. But I mean, I, I thought Dave said it very, very clearly and very eloquently, especially, you, you, you know, when you think of what M Michael Bennett said, um, with regards to what the NFL stands for behind the scenes. But the fact that, you know, you have the NFL who has consistently shown us and proven to us that they don't want to change, they don't plan on changing, they're just, it's like in a cartoon when, you know, you see something bad happening, but then you see the people doing the bad things, lift up a carpet and kind of sweep the bad stuff under the rug. <laughs> but there's like this nice little balloon set that's happening over in the other corner to try and distract us so that we don't see the person trying to hide everything under the carpet. That's essentially what the NFL did with the Super Bowl in the over the past two weeks. They trotted out the fact that they were going to take seven over 7,000 vaccinated healthcare workers, frontline workers, and bring them to the Super Bowl. But they also said, hey, look at this, while we also tell you we're going to have 14,500 other people who may or may not be vaccinated also right. in the student stadium. And then they trotted out, you know, let's get as many Black entertainers and yes. celebrities and good people so that we can show that we're all about the Black community and trot them out while we're also, you know, tearing down one of 
the nicest people in Colin Kaepernick, which to Dave's point, I'm really excited to now read the book that he's got coming out with him to hear these stories because the tea will be hot. That's all I have to say. And I had, I have no inside information on Dave's book, but I'm assuming the tea will be hot. So you consistently have the NFL showing you. And in the great words of Maya, Maya Angelou, when people show you who they are the first time, believe them. The NFL <laughs> has consistently showed us who they are time in and time, time again. Like, when are we going to start believing them? When are other people and other folks going to realize, like, they consistently and systemically show that they have racist and racial undertones in everything that they do and the way that they try to cover it up, lift the rug and sweep it all under and distract us in the other side is by adding in all these black people to try and make it look like they're doing something good for the community when in essence, they're not. Super Bowl halftime show comes around and apparently it's a big expensive affair. And our man The Weeknd from Scarborough invests $7 million of his own money into putting this show on. And, and I say invests rather than spends because if he spent it, he spent it. But he invested it because he spent that money and The Weeknd won the Super Bowl to a greater extent than Tom Brady did. I'm seeing way more Weeknd memes uh, than Tom Brady memes. Um, Megan McPeak, what do you make of The Weeknd's performance? What's, what was your favorite aspect of it? Um, for me, okay, so if, I mean, Dave knows this because he's probably taken the Metro in DC. Uh, Morgan, I'm not sure if you have, but there's one meme mm -hmm. that my Back in group the day, chat, yes. <laughs> my group chat, we have been laughing about since last night. And it was when he was in that like gold, um, kind of like when you go to a carnival and it's like the, the fun house mirrors. mirrors. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the gold mirrors. And the, the caption of it was when you're trying to find the exit in Metro City Center's um, metro station because it, it, it's a disaster it is a maze and I have been crying laughing about that because he literally took a performance that you know I've said it before my favorite part of of the Super Bowl is when you get to see the behind the scenes of how they put the halftime performance together mm -hmm. and everything that goes into it and into those like 12 minutes of just complete fire and hysteria hysteria because of what goes on behind the scenes um and that for me is always really cool to see what goes into it and i think him investing his own money into his performance says a lot about him and that's i think why he won but my my favorite part had to be the the fun house of mirrors in that gold thing just because <laughs> i pictured myself the first time i was at metro city center trying to find the exit and i couldn't <laughs> legit was lost for about 10 minutes <laughs> see now if you had known dave back then he could have got you back out onto the street really quick dave what was your favorite part of the weekend's halftime performance oh i mean i'm tempted to say it was the head injury dancers uh <laughs> but honestly i'm a bit of when it comes to these halftime performances, I'm starting to think that Prince ruined me for all halftime yes. shows. Because every time I see it, all I want to do is cap on the performance and the <laughs> dancers and the crowd. And, and, you know, that's not the healthiest response, especially when somebody's pumping their own money into it and trying to entertain me for, for free. <laughs> so, so props to The weekend for doing his thing and bringing love to Scarborough from Scarborough to the rest of the world. But I do feel that like sometimes I'm just watching it and I'm imagining Prince with that guitar and the skies opening and the rain falling right when he plays purple rain. And I'm thinking, why even try? Just replay <laughs> Prince all of the day. See, you know, I would watch that. And the thing about the weekend to me, I'm not a, like, I'm not deep into his uh, discography or anything like that. Uh, and I, but I, I do have to admire him. He's sort of like Tom Brady in that you looked at Tom Brady coming into the NFL, no muscles, no speed, not a ton of arm strength, but he made the most of it. He has stuck around. You listen to The Weeknd sing. The Weeknd to me, and people tell me I'm harsh on musicians. It's only because like I have a lot of musicians in my family, like people you have heard on the radio. The, hey, that's my uncle. That's my grandpa. Like I have musicians in the family. So we're harsh critics on musicians. So I hear The Weeknd, he just sounds like a guy singing in the corner of the high school cafeteria telling the people playing dominoes at the next table to keep it down because he can't sing loud enough to drown them out. But his voice is very, very, very razor thin, 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 paper thin. But 
he has made the most of it, right? He has parlayed that into this empire, into the Super Bowl halftime. And I would never, if you'd asked me uh, 10 years ago, or if you'd lined him up in a talent show and said, listen to these 10 people singing a talent show, one of these people is going to headline Super Bowl halftime. I would never have thought it would be the weekend, but he has made the most of the voice that he has and everything else about it. And he won the Super Bowl. He beat, he beat Patrick Mahomes and Tom Brady. And the only thing that's missing from all the fun house mirror memes, and I'm sure there's one out there, I just haven't seen it yet, is uh, the weekend running through the hallway of mirrors and then confronting Mr. Han from Enter the Dragon. Haven't seen that yet. Uh, I'm sure I will. <laughs>